Accutron Watches present. From New York City, this is the Accutron Show, a time travel through American culture with your hosts, Bill McCuddy, Scott Alexander, and David Graver. Visit AccutronWatch.com and discover the brand that has made American history with an all-new proprietary next-generation electrostatic energy movement. Accutron, it's not a timepiece, it's a conversation piece. It's not about who are the major pop stars, even though, yes, they consider the Apollo their home, but who are those artists who we know will be talking about 30, 40, 50 years from now? The voice you heard at the top of the show was Camilla Forbes. She's the executive director of the Apollo Theater in New York. Yes, it is showtime today at the Apollo and the Accutron Show with me. I'm Bill McCuddy and uh, this guy, uh, David Graver. David Graver. That's me. And also this guy, Scott Alexander. I make them say their names every now and then just to keep them on their toes. Hey, this is the Accutron Show, and we're going to learn all about the the birth of hip-hop, the great late Chadwick Boseman, and, as we said, the Apollo Theater. Uh, We'll do it all on the Accutron Show right after this. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com, and discover our iconic Space View 2020 collection, recreating the stunning visual impact of the original open dial design combined with an all new electrostatic energy movement. Time just changed again. The Accutron Space View 2020. Gentlemen, welcome to season three of the Accutron Uh, Show. It's good to be back. You know, when this started in the late 60s, I never thought that we would still be here this many, three seasons That's later. Right. David looks great. <laughs> Nothing, I, by the way, what qualifies as a season anymore? Like Dancing with the Stars is at season 74, and it's been on for four years, right? <laughs> right I mean, exactly. I, I don't understand how seasons work anymore, but I do know that I'm very happy to be sharing the microphone with these two. David, uh, your fondest memory over the years of the Accutron show. (laughs) (laughs) When you let me say my own name, Bill. Uh, That that time when you let me say my own name. Thank you. It was very meaningful to me. Wasn't that a movie? Normally it's say (laughs) my name, but in this case, say your name. Uh, Scott, (laughs) um, we have a, a great, great guest today, someone who is very involved in what's happening at the Apollo Theater. Yeah. Uh, which to I don't my, think a lot happens at the Apollo Theater without her involvement. But lots could have happened to the Apollo Theater because, well, first of all, have you, have you both ever set foot in the place? Yes, years, years ago. ago. Yeah, do you remember yeah. who you saw or what the occasion was? I saw a comedy show. It was like a showcase. Right. And I haven't been to the Apollo, but even before moving to New York City 20 years ago, I knew what it was and I looked up to it. Yeah. I, I mean, used to see this show at late, on late night TV. Right, Showtime at the Apollo. Yeah. I've been to a couple of benefits there. I couldn't. They were variety shows, and I couldn't tell you exactly who was there. Uh, I just know that there's an electricity to that place. But what I also know is that it's it probably I think at least two or three times in its history was threatened by closure. It uh, wasn't going to exist anymore because right. uh, well, first of all, there are no movie theaters left anymore. So this was a stage, and it was uptown. It was its own thing. It had its own audience, and. I'm just surprised it didn't turn into a gap or a or, right. or a benefit. It's, it's a something. Yeah. It's as small, wonderful miracle that it has persevered and like that people really cared enough to get behind it and make sure it didn't go away. That its legacy carries so many things. To today. You live in New York for long enough, and you see all your favorite things go away. And the idea that it's been there for that long is. Kind of sure, it matters definitely more to people in New York, but I think the Apollo as a name and as a thing and as a place has meant uh, something to everyone watching or listening to this around the country. Uh, they did a, I'm not going to ask our guest if they actually shot it there, but they did a marvelous Mrs. Maisel there, mm-hmm. uh, a big Great one episode. actually, uh, with Shy Baldwin and, uh, and, and that audience. That there's no other audience like the Apollo crowd. I mean, they come and they want you to bring your best. And, right, and if you don't do that, I'm sure There's our a guest certain, will tell uh, us honesty. Yeah, <laughs> which uh, is bracing. Yeah. If you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Uh, it uh, the Apollo Theaters had more than three seasons, so it's a uh, it's got a little uh, history on us. We don't have landmark status. I'm going to ask our guest if they do. I'm assuming at this point that building would have been long gone if it hadn't somehow 
had a senator or a congressman or a president. You know, speaking of presidents, Clinton has an office or did have an office right near uh, the Apollo. Right. So right. Uh, it's a cultural touchstone. It's an incredible uh, neighborhood that's enjoying a renaissance, not unlike the Harlem Renaissance that happened in the 20s. We will talk to our guest about that as well. She is Camilla Forbes, and this is the Accutron Show. We'll be back right after this. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, AccutronWatch.com, and discover our Accutron DNA collection. Reimagined for a new generation, the Accutron DNA combines breakthrough technology, precise engineering, and modern aesthetics to achieve a new level of technical excellence. The Accutron DNA, the new face of time for those who blaze new trails. Camilla Forbes is kind of runs everything at the Apollo Theater. And uh, Camilla, welcome to the Accutron Show. Thank you so much for having me. You know, one of the things the three of us were talking about before you came on is what a miracle that facility is just in terms of it's still standing. I mean, what has happened to Harlem in the new Renaissance and since the last one is that uh, it's gotten very, very popular. And everything, every corner that used to be a cute store, every place else in Manhattan is now a bank or uh, a Dwayne Reed. And the fact that, that, that it's still standing is kind of a miracle. Did, were there a couple of times there in the history where it might not have survived? Oh, yeah. I mean, we've had several times, I think, you know, and and, and I think it, it speaks to one, the testament of the legacy and the history of Apollo and what Apollo represents as sort of the cornerstone of, of black music, of black culture. But also, I mean, there were times in the uh, tenuous times in the early 70s um, and then another restart in the 80s. Um, there was another tenuous time in the 90s. There were also... You know, so there, there've been several. I would say that Apollo has lived several lives, um, um, but I think it's a it's it's a beautiful sort of thread. I think to the narrative of who the institution and who we are, um, and and how the resiliency of the institution and how it always seems to come back, um, and and I think the resiliency of the leadership throughout the years. Um, our, we have an incredible board, um, and we have an incredible. Well, circle of supporters who want to make sure that the Apollo is not only alive and opening, but thriving um, and continuing to, you know, innovate around culture and build around culture. And that's where we are today. Yeah. It seems like the essence of something that can stay alive for that long, it requires new growth at the bottom, right? Like if you become a legacy act, if you become something that's about nostalgia or looking back, um, that that's sort of the kiss of death. It feels like right. ultimately no, you have to like, grow and evolve. How are you guys finding that, yeah. that way to kind of reach out to younger folk or the next generation? Well, I think it's about like one, how we think about ourselves. Right. And, and, and one thing is important is that we cannot think about ourselves as a museum um, because exactly what you said, that is exactly the kiss of death for any cultural arts, living, breathing institution. Um, and, and then we've also got to think about ourselves. Well, you know, we did an exercise as an institution and what was the kind of breeding ground that Stevie Wonder would have needed in 1971 before he came out with Keys of Life, right? Like when, when he was a great musician, um, you know, we knew he was right there on the cusp, um, but, but who, what was the kind of place that he needed to support his work? That's the stance that we take as an institution so that we are constantly then looking at it, it is, it's, it's not about who are the major pop stars, even though, yes, they consider the Apollo their home, but who are those artists who we know will be talking about 30, 40, 50 years from now? And how do we make sure to provide a home from them? So for us, then it requires us across the board to constantly be looking in those places and building an institution for those artists based on their needs today which would have been different 20 years ago, right? Um, so that, that's really been sort of our position and how we make sure that we keep our finger on the pulse um, and make sure that we keep our ears to the ground um, to who are those y- younger um, um, contemporary mus- artists, um, not, not even just musicians, but really artists who are making waves. Or maybe that ear is to the stage right there. That's uh, right. Ooh, I like that. Right. Keeping our ear to the stage. That's great. In, this, in the same path that you've already started to go down, this motto, the Renaissance is now, is so deeply meaningful to me. I'm wondering if you can explain a little bit more what it means to you. 
Absolutely. Well, you know, we started um, this actually a few years ago. Um, we kept thinking about the year 2020, 2021 and what it meant to us. Um, and those years really marked the 100th year centennial anniversary of the Harlem Renaissance. And so we thought, wow, this is interesting. And the Apollo is in a moment of renaissance as we're not only expanding, we're expanding our footprint, we're expanding our building um, to the Victoria Theater. So we're in a growth period of renaissance. And then as we look around the artists who are creating now, we're seeing artists that are crossing disciplines that are, you know, you're not just seeing music artists anymore solely, like um, an artist that we support, Kamasi Washington, who's also a filmmaker. He's also scores film, but he's an amazing jazz musician as well. Our artist in resident, residence at the Apollo, which is known for music, is actually a writer because he crosses all genres. He's a screenwriter. He's a play. You know, he's been writing comic books as well. He's, you know, the foremost writer on culture. And that's what was happening during the Renaissance 100 years from now. Artists did not solely sit in silos. They were intersecting with scholars. And, and so therefore you found this extremely exciting mix within culture um, that marked that time period. So that's what it meant to us, you know, this and, and, and why actually a few years back we thought, okay, 2021, 22 was going to be our new Renaissance year. But then we noticed a few other things happened. The conditions under which the Harlem Renaissance was born is that the country was coming out of a very, um, I would say that the, the government at the time was extremely uh, fascist. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and, and we were also coming out of the heels of the Spanish flu a global pandemic and definitely obviously a country pandemic. And so what you saw was almost like this reawakening of culture, the reawakening of people, the reclamation of arts and culture and connectivity because we were divorced from it and almost stifled from it for so long. Um, and, and these were the conditions under which the Harlem Renaissance was born. And therefore we, we thought to, wow, and look at us now in 2022, this idea of renaissance that had a, a different meaning and resonance for us um, and as we started to think about thematics for the season. So we really just sort of grabbed the reins and took hold and ran with it. So you're saying the global pandemic and creeping fascism were gifts? <laughs> <laughs> and something we, we repeated 100 years later? Um, uh, yeah, right, right. Yeah. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, I know, I know it's kind of crazy because, um, I, you know, initially, even when we were thinking about the Renaissance, we weren't, obviously we couldn't predict those conditions because we were trying to, we kind of look a few seasons out when we think about sort of curating for the season, but the way that the stars aligned were so uncanny. Um, and that's, that's sort of the, when you think about it, I mean, that's, that's sort of the wave of how culture is built, right? Culture is never built in a vacuum. Um, culture is, is built by responding to the conditions in and around our world. Um, and, 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 and I believe that it's all cyclical. I believe that, you know, the art that we create defines our culture. The culture that we create defines our policy and then vice versa, right? It becomes a cyclical nature. And then policy we respond to that ultimately defines our art. It's cyclical. It's all one and one in conversation with one another. Yeah. And it feels like pressure and hardship are actually a necessary piece of that alchemy. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's, that's definitely I mean, a part of a lot of the music that uh, and a lot of the art that gets performed at the Apollo. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. You had, you'd mentioned earlier what it means to you, the Apollo. I want to talk about just for a moment, and we have so much to talk about, and new artists, uh, you're involved in the hip-hop world, and, and I want to get into that. But w before we leave the Apollo, you talked about what it means to you. What do you think it means to a performer to say they've yeah. been at the Apollo? And then I wonder also what you... Uh, why the Bulova folks, who are our uh, cousins here from uh, Accutron, were interested in devoting a timepiece or a collection of timepieces to a place. What do you think it means to them? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, well, you know, thinking about the artists, right, I think, and, um, and I'll even give you, you know, an example. When I walk to, into work every day, I come through the stage door because I want to walk across the stage every day as a reminder. Uh, you know, of who walked across the stage before me. 
And before I sit at my desk, before I start stressing about calendar schedules and budgets, <laughs> I, I've got to ground myself in why I'm here um, and the importance of why I'm here. And I think it's that same reverence that artists performing here, and I mean artists from all walks of life, right? Like um, not only sort of that young musician from Cincinnati who has grown up hearing about the Apollo from whether it's the TV show back in the 90s or their parents or grandparents, et cetera, or it's an artist like her who um, is now a global superstar but started in at Amateur Night when she headlined her show at the Apollo, because she was at Amateur Night when she was nine years old, started her career, coming back to the Apollo to headline after she's played stadium worldwide tours, you could see how special it felt for her in that it's almost like, wow, I did it. I did it. I headlined the show in the same breath that Ella Fitzgerald, that James Brown, right? That Aretha Franklin. This was their home and now it's mine as if I've been inducted into a hall of fame of artists that have come before me. There's a, there's a real sort of um, embrace that happens in that moment. Um, and, and so, and I think all artists feel that. And, and quite frankly, all people, like I said, when I walk across the stage going to work. And so that piece of legacy around what the Apollo represents, right? Um, sometimes when I think about the Apollo, I've, I've heard someone say that it, it represents, when you come to the Apollo, you want to bring the best of yourself and all of yourself. Um, if you've ever been to a performance of the Apollo, people show up who they are in every aspect. No one is asking them to stifle, to constrict, et cetera, but bringing the best of themselves. So when I think about the timepiece, that's what it represents. It holds all of the history, all of the legacy, but also this idea of excellence, this idea of bringing your whole and full self to the world. Um, so the fact that Bulova uh, you know, um, have had approached us, uh, um, you know, about this collaboration. I thought it was so exciting because when you think about those two brands, when you think about Bulova and what it represents as history, relevance, uh, reverence, the reverence, right, of of like of a, an exquisite timepiece, and then you think about the richness of the culture and the history and legacy of Apollo. It, it kind of goes hand in hand, and I, and I think it's been a beautiful marriage ever since. Well, we don't often put our sponsor into the program, but because the Apollo had had this unique new alliance, we definitely wanted to talk about it. We have so much more to talk about, and I uh, am excited to hear about some of the other things you've done, including some of the philanthropic stuff, but we are having a showtime at the Apollo of our own, and now that you have inspired us, we are trying to bring our best, uh, so we, oh. need, we need a break to come back and see if that's even possible. Uh, Great. <laughs> there's more of the Accutron show right after this. This podcast is presented by Accutron Watches. Visit our website, accutronwatch.com, and discover our legacy collection. Reviving some of the most memorable Accutron watches from the 60s and 70s, the legacy collection combines timeless design with the technical excellence of Swiss watchmaking, each limited to 600 individually numbered pieces. The Accutron Legacy Collection, inspired by the past, built for the future. We're back with Camilla Forbes, and we are having our own little showtime at the Apollo, as we <laughs> said. She is the artistic director there and also doing tons of other things. We heard a lot about the history of, uh, of the Apollo Theater, and uh, now we're going to get into some of the other things she's working on. But I think we had one more follow-up about the Apollo from the young cub reporter, David Graber. I do have a sort of two-pronged question for you, one being... What do you think is your earliest memory of the Apollo or your first exposure to the Apollo? And then Ooh. I'm sure you've seen remarkable performances and had tremendous experiences there. Can you tell us something that was a milestone for you? Oh, OK. OK, so I can absolutely tell you my first memory of the Apollo. My earliest memory before I actually touched ground of Apollo was waking up, not waking up, staying up uh, till midnight to watch Showtime at the Apollo. I grew up in Chicago. And so that's when it came on in, in, my, um, in my area and watching the performers. And I used to love when Kiki Shepard would come on and, and the hosts would do these like, you know, history legacy bits about the Apollo. Um, and, and then you got to see these new artists with these amazing performances. I just thought that that just blew my mind. So I was always a Showtime fan. 
And then fast forward, I moved when I moved to New York um, in uh, late '90s, early 2000s. I, um, I, one of the first things I did, I, I moved to Brooklyn, um, and I remember taking the train up to 125th Street to Harlem. And I didn't know anyone in Harlem. I didn't have any friends in Harlem, but I just wanted to get on on 125th Street and see the sign and see the marquee and coming out of the train and seeing that sort of blade, the Apollo blade. It felt, there was something that felt so um, large, almost like a goal, right? Like it felt like, okay, I'm here now in New York. The grind is on. Let's go. I can see my goal in, 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 in view. And it wasn't about working at the Apollo. I never, ever in a million years thought I would ever work. You know, it, it, that wasn't a part of my like vision board. And probably because I never just thought it was possible. Um, but it was just the symbol of what the Apollo meant that um, it's here in New York. And I've now arrived in New York. My journey is just now beginning. That's what that moment meant for me when I saw it. Um, and ironically, that was a time when, as we talked about earlier, when the Apollo went through some ups and downs, it was closed as a building, right? Our board was just, it just became taken over by the state, just became turned into a nonprofit. Um, and it was, you know, the infrastructure was just early beginning to be built um, and, and pushing it towards the status as a performing arts center, but it wasn't quite there yet. So it was almost like myself and the Apollo were beginning our own journey <laughs> um, or our different journey at the same, you know, in that early 2000 period. Um, and let's see, dynamic performances. Hmm. Or someone been... or someone that got booed off or, or like some crazy oh. moment where they, uh, the Sandman <laughs> came out and said, you're gone. I mean, I, that's oh brutal. Let's be gosh. honest. Let's be honest to people who don't know and are listening or watching this podcast. It's a brutal room. It's, you have to bring your A plus game or that audience says, not we don't yeah. like you, just you're not no. good enough for the Apollo. No, absolutely. We have the saying, be good or be gone. That's <laughs> yeah, it. Right. Like, that's all, right? Well, we're, we're going to get up and leave now then. Uh. <laughs> I, know. <laughs> I know, be good or be gone. Um, I know, you know what? I mean, Hammer, let me think. I mean, I have, um, I'll tell you one, actually, uh, and, and actually there's a, there's a dovetail um, to a story. Um, uh, well, 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 I'll go into that. I'll go into that story. Okay. Okay. Let me think. Let me think. Hold on. There's, there's so many. Whenever I get asked this question, I like got to have the ones in my pocket. Um, well, you know what I'll say? You know what? When Yolanda Adams, she, we had her for a show called Holiday Joy. And, um, and, and, uh, I remember when she performed on stage, it, you know, it, it, it's interesting because I've worked in a lot of theaters across the country. Um, and you know, there's a way in which you operate and act when you're in the theater, right. And certain theaters, which are more like physically conservative, et cetera. And this is obviously not the Apollo. And when Yolanda came and performed, it was a holiday show it was during Christmas time. Folks were coming from all over the city. And she really turned the space into church. And folks who I, I realize may not even never had, you know, the Black Church Baptist experience had it. 1,600 people, 100 people had that experience in that church, in the church hall, hallowed halls that we call the Apollo um, that day. And I remember thinking, wow, the, the power of not only the artist who's on the stage, but also the power of the building and the space to transform people who they could have seen the same set at the beacon or Madison square gardens. And you would not have felt the same kind of energy that, that flowed and, and everyone threw their hands up in the air, given prayer. Like it was, it was, it was really wild. And I, I would say that was, that was for me one that, that just gives me chills every time I think about it. Did moms Mabley really open for Midge Maisel? Yeah, Shy Baldwin. Do you know? You obviously know what I'm talking about. So, did they do the marvelous yeah. Mrs. Maisel this this season? Had a big uh, scene at the mm -hmm. Apollo. Was it shot there, or is that someplace else doubling for the no, Apollo? No, no, nope. That was shot at the Apollo. Um, oh, that is and, very and, cool. Yeah, yeah. We did a great panel actually with them and a few of our historians um, talking specifically about Mom's Mom's Babley. 
um, and her legacy at the Apollo. Yeah, and you found that a lot, right? There were a lot of, whether it's, um, you know, white performers and or comedians specifically at that time who wanted to play for in front of a different audience um, and and see how those how, how that material landed um, and how their material landed. And uh, yeah. And that's so still proud, happening, but yeah. right? I mean, it still happens. Yeah. yeah look, we have, um, oh, we have, uh, we have a couple shows opening up. I, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm thinking, you I know, think what I saw I Dimitri announce. Martin played there recently. And yes, yeah. yes, yes. Uh, we also had U2 last year, which was pretty fun. U2. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah. Wow. Oh yeah. That was a great show. It was a great show. Um, you know, Chris Martin, we also, you know, so it was, yeah. um, we've had, we've had, a, you know, a, a wide range of folks who want to, you know, be in proximity to the magic of the building. Right. You mentioned uh, this idea of be good or be gone. And that also in conjunction with you talking about walking in through the stage door and thinking about all the people who have come before, it's really easy to index your, your view of the Apollo through these amazing performers on the stage and everything else. But it occurs to me there's probably many more people who operate sort of behind the scenes and that you're sort of the, the, you know, the, the leading edge of the, of this legacy. Does that ever weigh on you that this idea of be good or be gone, like the Apollos had tough times before that, like it's got to, it's, it's a whole different meaning when it comes to the administration of, of an institution yeah. like that. Right. Oh, that's a great question. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think we feel that pressure. Um, I think we feel that pressure on a few levels. Number one, you know, when you think about cultural arts institutions and of our size, right, we have an annual operating, um, you know, we vacillate between 15 million on up, um, you know, from a performing arts center, but the specifically um, a, a black performing arts center, we're singular in that. Um, and so there's a certain amount of pressure that we feel around this need to be excellence about representing that excellence, right? And about that pressure about representation and how we show up in the world, simply because just at this time, it's not as if there is a multitude of black performing arts centers around the world of our side. Um, and so there's their sense, hence there, be, there bears a certain amount of responsibility and a huge responsibility that I think that our staff um, and our administration and board feel on a consistent basis. Uh, what I will say is that we have a fantastic team. We have a fantastic team of arts administrators working behind the scenes of arts educators running our education department who are just top notch. Um, you know, we have full-time staff of almost 80, over 80 people, um, um, part, well, part-time, um, you know, over 400. And so there's an incredible, um, you know, crew of, of people who are working for the Apollo and and, and who I think are, who are committed to that cause and who are committed to building, um, you know, a, just a, a, a truly remarkable and, and standalone organization. And, uh, and, I, and I'm really proud to be a part of the, the organization, but I'm also more proud to be a part in, in, in the company of people that we work with. I have a bit of a left field question for you. Um, sure. I believe that I read that you actually studied theater or your degree is in theater. How, That's right. How, how has a degree in theater informed the work that you do both at the Apollo and elsewhere in your life? Yeah. So, you know, I came to the Apollo um, and I still am. I'm a director. Um, I'm a director of theater and television and film. And um, coming to the Apollo as, you know, an arts administrator really it sort of relies on my producerial skills. But I really approach everything as a director, I would say. Um, with this sense of, you know, I, I, and, I, and I try to express this to my staff as well, is that, you know, we, we have to look at this institution and, and how we're building it almost like a blank canvas, almost like a blank stage. And what are the tools that we are going to use to paint our canvas, you know, to build our stage with, whether they're artists, whether it's our building, um, whether it's the seasons, the narratives that we're creating. Um, for our seasons, um, the themes that we're creating for our season. These are all tools that we are using to ultimately build um, what the public will see as the Apollo. Um, so, I mean, I think for me, you know, it's as an artist, it's always about using and leaning on this world of imagination um, and, and constantly informing that. What's so interesting is that, you know, a lot of other arts institutions, 
sometimes you can fall, you can easily fall so far away from that. And then you wake up and say, wait, why am I here again? And it's like, oh, oh, I'm here because of that love that I have for the art, for the magic, for the play, for the use of play, for our imagination and how the, you know, the world of of culture and art can transport you in an instant to a different place. That's a constant reminder, I think, for um, a, a place and a home to stay vibrant to stay current is we've always got to be accessing our imagination. The second that it becomes rote, that what we do becomes too rote, we failed, we failed. So for me, I think it's, you know, using my, my world as a theater artist, my world as a director comes in play by constantly, not only pushing myself, pushing my staff, pushing these teams to constantly use their imagination in, in, in every aspect of, 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 of their work. Say, uh, I want to talk about hip hop because it seems to be a particular uh, love of yours. And there's something you're behind called the Hip Hop Theater. Tell us about that. Yeah. So this organization that I founded um, almost close to over 20 years ago, and it was really out of school and kids who wanted to combine arts, culture, theater and hip hop. Um, And um, and it was a company of artists. And this was well before Hamilton. Um, matter of fact, um, yes, Lin Manuel Miranda actually applied to be a part of our festival um, with his first musical, In the Heights. Um, and so, you know, I think it was again, it was a really moment in time of a generational voice um, wanting to be heard, but not having space in the traditional theaters of the world, the off-Broadway theaters, the, you know, resident theaters, weren't producing younger artists. Um, They weren't producing nor speaking to younger audiences. And this was an opportunity to say, hey, we love theater. This is our world. And we want to see ourselves reflected on stage. So we produced this festival and produced a lot of our friends who are now, you know, doing really great big things right now. Um, But that was a festival was about, you know, providing a home. Yeah, I'm I'm fascinated the fact that hip hop 20 years ago might not have still existed today, uh, and that that long ago you were like, no, this is this is an art form that we're going to recognize and we're going to keep it growing. And and we talked about discovering new artists at a place like the Apollo, and this is seems to be just another example of that. That's right. That's right. That's exactly it. Um, so I feel like for me, it's just a continuation of the work that I've always done. Hmm. I mean, it's. Super interesting. I mean, are there other communities? I, I'm it, when you said talked about theater and hip hop, and someone like Lemmy Miranda bringing in the Heights, which when that hit, you know, well, well before Hamilton, that wasn't really people hadn't really seen something like that on the stage before. And it reminds me of something like a Strange Loop that's out now, where you get that you we're getting some voices that are finally breaking through into kind of mainstream stages, but that they require these incubators from these mm-hmm. these other places. Is that is that a role that you see this festival fulfilling? Yeah, absolutely. And it's still fulfilling. I mean, I think it's, you know, frequently we definitely look back and, and, or we, we look to, it's still ongoing, you know, festivals like that and other, other places like that or organizations like high arts. We have a brilliant um, new works director. Her name is um, um, Kelly Gerard um, and Kelly founded a festival herself, which has sort of taken the mantle also of the work that we were doing with a theater festival called the fire of the time and, and really showcasing, you know, those next voices who are on the rise. And, and, and that's where we look to mine. Okay. Wh- who are these artists? Who are some of these other artists that we can circle around and support? You know, so it, those, those places are really important because it provides a platform for other institutions and almost a platform and like a finger, like, Hey, check out these folks right here. Make sure, don't, you know, so, you know, when, when institutions are like, oh, we don't know where to find those artists. Well, no, you, you, they're, they're actually over here. They're over here. They're over here. That's why those platforms are really important. Who's on your dream list to appear either on the Apollo stage or at one of your hip hop festivals? You Who? know who's on my dream list for the Apollo is Kendrick Lamar. Oh, really? So yeah, so if you if you can if you can get to him and uh, <laughs> if he has time after the Barclays Theater and MSG, I will tweet at him later today. Yeah, <laughs> he watches this show every week, so I don't think there's any problem now reaching out to him. That's he great. Knows. That's awesome. That's awesome. That'd be great. <laughs> Just, just send me his text, you know, send me his number. I'll be, yeah, and of all the, all the people that have performed there, if you could get in a time machine and go back and see one, who would you see? 
um, probably Ella Fitzgerald for sure. Yeah. I'd want to know what her voice sounds like in person. Do you, yeah. do you walk across that stage every day or do you stop in the middle every now and then and take a big deep breath and go, Hmm, if I was going to, and then maybe belt something out, which you're free to do here on the, on the podcast, you're, if you'd like. You're so very funny. Um, I never belt out because I never know who's, nobody wants to hear me sing. I will tell you that. Remember, be good or be gone. And I know my lane. It is not that. I would like to stay. It is not that. Mentioning Kendrick, I think you've touched upon a really important artist today who finds a way to move general audiences and still contribute intelligent, influential social commentary. That's sort of like the basis of hip hop. Can you tell me how you've seen hip hop evolve and how your interest in hip hop has changed over the years? Oh, um, so, I mean, I think how I've seen it evolve is almost like how I've evolved too, right? Like hip hop is now next year, we'll be celebrating it's, is it the 50th year anniversary? 50 or 40, ooh. Oh, I got to check my dates. 1970. Anyway, in any case, um, it's, you know, I think a major milestone, uh, which also there's a meaning in which there's several generations that now reside inside the culture. Um, you know, you have a generation of folks who are, you know, you can potentially get their AARP cards, um, you know, to, um, you know, to, and, and this was a culture truly for youth, for young people to find a voice um, um, a, a voice that was all their own, that was not controlled by any other system and specifically young people of color, right? Um, to, to find a voice, to be seen, to be heard. That was always the core basis of this culture. Um, and now we see several, many different generations that now still are able to find their voice, their place inside this culture, you know, we call hip hop. But not only several generations, it has now expanded into a global culture, right? So now you have young people and people across the world who have found their voice, who found their identity, or who just find a likeness and a symbioticness um, with, um, you know, with the tenets of hip hop. So I, I think that's where I have seen it grow and where I've seen it gone. And quite frankly, you know, and, and myself, right, I have grown throughout this time period. Um, and, and as I've matured, the culture has also matured and I can consistently find my place, but it's also still innovating, you know? And when I think about like, you know, the, the, the what the young people are doing now with the culture, I find it fascinating and like, oh my gosh, this is again, once again, innovation. This it's a culture that is constantly innovating and constantly moving. It's not, it is not about, you know, fixing or canonizing itself in a way under which it cannot further evolve like other art forms. Um, and that, that's where I think the beauty of hip hop really lies. Um, and, um, you know, it's why I'm so excited to, to constantly keep my ear to the ground. The uh, I'm reminded of the famous Chuck D quote that hip hop is black CNN. At the time when he that's said right. that, um, it w it really was. There were not a lot of media avenues. You know, it was this primary media avenue that was able to kind of break through pop culture in a way that other things had not. In that intervening time, it feels like that's changed a bit. That that the channels have opened up a little bit, especially with the internet and with with all the yeah. online sort of stuff. And also, you know, culture's changing, and places like Broadway and things are changing. Has that changed the nature or the role of hip hop as these other avenues have started to open up? Well, I think I, I think in, in two ways, I think you have several streams now, right? Because quite frankly, hip hop, which was a subculture, has now have a mainstream vein. So there is a huge sort, you know, when you think about pop music and pop culture, hip hop is hand in hand, right? So, but I will say is that there still remains a subcultured ness as I talk about that necessity to innovate, the necessity um, to claim ownership without having the gateholders or the gatekeepers of the music industry or the record labels having to crown you um, in order to be accepted. I, 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 there is still that um, essence and that underbelly within the culture that still exists. Um, where as long as I have, you know, my own microphone, a beat machine, or I don't even need that, 
right? I don't need, I, all I need is myself to create my art, um, you know, and, and a willing audience who listen. So I, I still think that that's absolutely still there. And then with the on, advent of the internet and technology, you can now reach masses of people without having to, you know, make it to MTV, without having to make it to any of these other outlets that those are, those are not necessary. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. Uh, also, when those young people get to their AARP card age, they will appreciate the 15% off of collision and damage you, on their auto go. insurance. Take go. it from me. I know That's it. Right. Hey, listen, right. uh, we That's cannot right. cannot let you go without uh, talking for a moment about the late, great Chadwick Boseman, who you had the uh, privilege of working with. I wonder, tell us what that was, what that project was about and what your fondest memory of him was. Um, so yeah, so Chad and I um, were very close. Um, we went to college together. Um, we started in theater organization together, Hip Hop Theater Junction, which we wrote plays together, which ultimately became the Hip Hop Theater Festival. Um, um, we were collaborators, but also we were very close friends. Um, and one of my fondest memory, and I'll, and I'll even tie this to the Apollo, um, I remember amongst the um, first Black Panther release, um, we, um, Chad came and spoke with ta Coates and Lupita Nyong'o um, about uh, Black Panther. And it was the week of the release and we had a, we held a panel discussion with the three of them. And when I tell you it was, um, you know, just the theater was on fire. But w- one of the moments that I remember from Chad is that there was this young boy in the front row who came dressed as Black Panther, full on, like, mask and etc i mean the theater we we sold out this show in five minutes and our inner our website like literally almost broke this was a panel discussion not even a show so you could imagine the energy in the theater so many people wanted to get in but there was this young boy who was about probably five years old in the costume and when chad got out on stage and the panel discussion had already started he literally stopped and said hey you little man and brought him up to the stage and signed his little costume and gave him a hug. And I could only, now that I'm even thinking about it, like how significant that moment was, um, how significant it was for that little boy to meet Black Panther. Um, and then even knowing now that, you know, Chad is not with us in the physical realm any longer, um, how significant it was for all of us to witness his grace um, and humility um, in that moment. It was, you know, it was special. It was special. Uh, as was he. And you have a little one in the background we can hear every now and then as well. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, listen, yes. Uh, Camilla, what a great uh, pleasure it's ha- been to have you here on the Accutron Show. Thank you for joining. Come back anytime that you want to talk about anything that you've got working, and okay. we'd love to have you. Great. Sounds good. I would love to. And thank you guys for having me on. This has been Sure. Fantastic. Enjoy the thank rest you. of your vacation. Thanks, Camilla. We're we'll on do. our way. We'll do. I'm on a plane. Bye, guys. All right. Bye bye. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for listening to The Accutron Show. To listen to all of our shows, visit AccutronWatch.com. To learn more about the world of Accutron, follow us on Instagram at Accutron Watch and subscribe to our podcast. From New York City, until next time, Accutron Time.